Chapter Four of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black, Volume One, by Stendhal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Four A Father and a Son. A Sara Mia Culpa, Secosie? Machiavelli. My wife really has a head on her shoulders, said the mayor of Verrieres at six o'clock the following morning, as he went down to the sawmill of Father Sorel. It had never occurred to me that if I do not take little Abbe Sorel, who they say knows Latin like an angel, that restless spirit, the director of the workhouse, might have the same idea and snatch him away from me. Though of course I told her that it had, in order to preserve my proper superiority. And how smugly, to be sure, would he talk about his children's tutor! The question is, once the tutor's mine, shall he wear the cassock? Monsieur de Renal was absorbed in this problem when he saw a peasant in the distance, a man nearly six feet tall, who since dawn had apparently been occupied in measuring some pieces of wood which had been put down alongside the dubes on the towing path. The peasant did not look particularly pleased when he saw Monsieur the Mayor approach, as these pieces of wood obstructed the road and had been placed there in breach of the rules. Father Sorel, for it was he, was very surprised, and even more pleased at the singular offer which Monsieur de Renal made him for his son Julian. None the less he listened to it with that air of sulky discontent and apathy which the subtle inhabitants of these mountains know so well how to assume. Slaves as they have been since the time of the Spanish conquest, they still preserve this feature, which is also found in the character of the Egyptian phila. Sorel's answer was at first simply a long-winded recitation of all the formulas of respect which he knew by heart. While he was repeating these empty words with an uneasy smile, which accentuated all the natural disingenuousness, if not indeed knavishness, of his physiognomy, the active mind of the old peasant tried to discover what reason could induce so important a man to take into his house his good-for-nothing of a son. He was very dissatisfied with Julian, and it was for Julian that Monsieur de Renal offered the undreamt-of salary of three hundred francs a year, with board and even clothing. This latter claim, which Father Sorel had had the genius to spring upon the mayor, had been granted with equal suddenness by Monsieur de Renal. This demand made an impression on the mayor. It is clear, he said to himself, that since Sorel is not beside himself with delight over my proposal, as in the ordinary way he ought to be, he must have had offers made to him elsewhere, and whom could they have come from if not from Valenod? It was in vain that Monsieur de Renal pressed Sorel to clinch the matter then and there. The old peasant, astute man that he was, stubbornly refused to do so. He wanted, he said, to consult his son, as if in the provinces, forsooth, a rich father consulted a penniless son for any other reason than as a mere matter of form. A water sawmill consists of a shed by the side of a stream. The roof is supported by a framework resting on four large timber pillars. A saw can be seen going up and down at a height of eight to ten feet in the middle of the shed, while a piece of wood is propelled against the saw by a very simple mechanism. It is a wheel whose motive power is supplied by the stream, which sets in motion this double piece of mechanism, the mechanism of the saw which goes up and down, and the mechanism which gently pushes the piece of wood towards the saw, which cuts it up into planks. Approaching his workshop, Father Sorel called Julian in a stentorian voice. Nobody answered. He only saw his giant elder sons, who, armed with heavy axes, were cutting up the pine planks which they had to carry to the saw. They were engrossed in following exactly the black mark traced on each piece of wood, from which every blow of their axes threw off enormous shavings. They did not hear their father's voice. The latter made his way towards the shed. He entered it and looked in vain for Julian in the place where he ought to have been by the side of the saw. He saw him five or six feet higher up, sitting astride one of the rafters of the roof. Instead of watching attentively the action of the machinery, Julian was reading. Nothing was more antipathetic to old Sorel. He might possibly have forgiven Julian his puny physique, ill-adapted as it was to manual labor, and different as it was from that of his elder brothers, but he hated this reading mania he could not read himself. It was in vain that he called Julian two or three times. It was the young man's concentration on his book, rather than the din made by the saw, which prevented him from hearing his father's terrible voice. 
At last the latter, in spite of his age, jumped nimbly on to the tree that was undergoing the action of the saw, and from there on to the crossbar that supported the roof. A violent blow made the book which Julian held go flying into the stream. A second blow on the head, equally violent, which took the form of a box on the ears, made him lose his balance. He was on the point of falling twelve or fifteen feet lower down into the middle of the levers of the running machinery, which would have cut him to pieces, but his father caught him as he fell in his left hand. "'So that's it, is it, lazy bones? Always going to read your damned books, are you, when you're keeping watch on the saw? You read them in the evening, if you want to, when you go to play the fool at the cure's. That's the proper time.' Although stunned by the force of the blow and bleeding profusely, Julian went back to his official post by the side of the saw. He had tears in his eyes, less by reason of the physical pain than on account of the loss of his beloved book. "'Get down, you beast, when I am talking to you!' The noise of the machinery prevented Julian from hearing this order. His father, who had gone down, did not wish to give himself the trouble of climbing up on to the machinery again and went to fetch a long fork used for bringing down nuts, with which he struck him on the shoulder. Julian had scarcely reached the ground when old Sorel chased him roughly in front of him and pushed him roughly towards the house. "'God knows what he is going to do with me,' said the young man to himself. As he passed, he looked sorrowfully into the stream into which his book had fallen. It was the one that he held dearest of all, the memorial of St. Helena. He had purple cheeks and downcast eyes. He was a young man of eighteen to nineteen years old, and of puny appearance, with irregular but delicate features, and an aquiline nose. The big, black eyes, which betokened in their tranquil moments a temperament at once fiery and reflective, were at the present moment animated by an expression of the most ferocious hate. Dark chestnut hair, which came low down over his brow, made his forehead appear small, and gave him a sinister look during his angry moods. It is doubtful if any face out of all the innumerable varieties of the human physiognomy was ever distinguished by a more arresting individuality. A supple, well-knit figure indicated agility rather than strength. His air of extreme pensiveness and his great pallor had given his father the idea that he would not live, or that if he did it would only be to be a burden to his family. The butt of the whole house, he hated his brothers and his father. He was regularly beaten in the Sunday sports in the public square. A little less than a year ago, his pretty face had begun to win him some sympathy among the young girls. Universally despised as a weakling, Julian had adored that old surgeon major, who had one day dared to talk to the mayor on the subject of the plane trees. This surgeon had sometimes paid Father Sorel for taking his son for a day, and had taught him Latin and history, that is to say, the 1796 campaign in Italy, which was all the history he knew. When he died, he had bequeathed his cross of the Legion of Honor, his arrears of half-pay, and thirty or forty volumes, of which the most precious had just fallen into the public stream, which had been diverted owing to the influence of Monsieur the Mayor. Scarcely had he entered the house when Julian felt his shoulder gripped by his father's powerful hand. He trembled, expecting some blows. "'Answer me without lying!' cried the harsh voice of the old peasant in his ears, while his hand turned him round and round like a child's hand turns round the lead soldier. The big black eyes of Julian filled with tears, and were confronted by the small gray eyes of the old carpenter, who looked as if he meant to read to the very bottom of his soul. End of chapter 4